Mr. Bonner. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Commission. It's a pleasure to have a chance to uh, appear before the 9-11 Commission and to uh, discuss with you the ways that 9-11 uh, and the aftermath impacted on United States Customs, how Customs responded to 9-11, and ultimately, uh, the evolution, uh, as Mr. Ziegler alluded to, uh, of the creation of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Bureau within a new department of our government. Um, on the morning of 9-11, I had not been confirmed yet as the Commissioner of Customs. I was uh, uh, a, I guess, a Commissioner designate, had a, a temporary office on the fourth floor of the Treasury Department, and uh, with all the other employees of Treasury. At about 9.30, 9.35 a.m., I evacuated the Treasury Department uh, and uh, joined the then acting Secretary of the Treasury, Ken Dam, at uh, the Secret Service uh, Headquarters Command Center a few blocks away. And once there, I did establish immediately contact with U.S. Customs Headquarters at the Ronald Reagan Building. Um, at about 10.05 a.m. on the morning of uh, September the 11th, U.S. Customs went to a level one alert at all the ports of entry of the country, and that is the highest level of security alert short of actually shutting down the border ports of entry. We did so, as Commissioner Ziegler indicated, uh, in coordination with the INS. Uh, besides going to level one alert, uh, which, by the way, means uh, significantly increasing the questioning of people entering the United States, uh, passengers, vehicles, uh, as well as the inspection of vehicles and cargo, uh, Customs also repositioned several of its Black Hawk helicopters from the southern border with Mexico to the northeast to aid the recovery efforts. Uh, on the morning of 9-11, uh, through an evaluation of data, uh, by the way, this was the passenger manifest, uh, <coughs> which U.S. Customs was able to access from the airlines. Uh, I would say within about an hour of 9-11, uh, U.S. Customs Office of Intelligence had identified the 19 probable hijackers, uh, as well as uh, uh, a complete list of the passengers on the aircraft. Um, by the way, Customs was also struck directly uh, on 9-11. Uh, the U.S. Customs House in New York City was located at Six World Trade Center. It's an eight-story building that was immediately north of the North Tower, and it was destroyed, of course, completely when the uh, the North Tower fell. Fortunately, uh, all 800 customs employees in New York City at, that were in that building, that worked in that building, were unharmed. And of course, the loss of our building is nothing in comparison to the thousands of people that were murdered on the morning of 9-11. I was confirmed uh, on uh, September 19th by the Senate and sworn in a few days later. Uh, let me just say, first of all, that uh, it was very apparent to me, and I think many people at U.S. Customs, that uh, that the agency's mission and its future had been uh, dramatically changed by what had happened. Uh, it certainly was clear to me that our priority mission had changed from one of interdiction of illegal drugs and trade regulation and, uh, and the like to a security prevention mission, uh, and to put it very plainly and bluntly, preventing terrorist or terrorist weapons from entering our country. Um, we also saw, by the way, after 9-11 on the 12th and the 13th and 14th, uh, we saw that level one alert was one thing, but uh, uh, on the, few, the, the day after and the few days after 9-11, we saw wait times go at our, at our border ports of entry go jump, uh, particularly at the northern border, from about an average of 20 minutes uh, before 9-11 uh, at the Ambassador Bridge, for example, from Ontario into Detroit. They jumped from 20 minutes to 12 hours overnight. So by September 12th, there was a 12-hour wait time, which was impacting uh, many of the companies on our side of the borders, including the automakers who had just-in-time inventories. Uh, by the way, that was across the border. At Buffalo, uh, the bridges over Buffalo were also 10 to 12-hour wait times within a day or two of 9-11, as well as the bridge at Port Huron. So we virtually shut down the borders uh, by going to level one alert. Uh, suffice it to say, and I won't go into detail, it's in my testimony, uh, we worked with Governor Engler to get National Guard support. We worked, uh, we, uh, worked uh, uh, the inspectors were working uh, 12 or 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we we TDY temporarily duty assigned uh, people to uh, the northern ports of entry from uh, as far away as Los Angeles. Uh, we did everything necessary to both maintain security, but by... Uh, September 17th or September 18th, we had gotten the wait times down to near where they had been prior to 9-11. Um, 
It was also clear to me that if we were going to be able to uh, perform our anti-terrorism mission, that we were going to need to have uh, advanced information about people and cargo coming into the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, we did, just very quickly, there were a couple of things that were very important. One was uh, we did obtain legislation with the support of the administration uh, in the Transportation Security Act that mandated for the first time that all airlines that were flying passengers into the United States from abroad had to, were required to provide the advanced passenger information with respect to everybody on that flight and also the, 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 the personal name uh, data with respect to those passengers. That was uh, enacted in November of 2001 and we were able to get very fast compliance with that law in part by making it clear to airlines that did not comply with the law that Customs was going to go to 100 percent inspection of all their passengers arriving at JFK and other airports around the country. The second thing we did was we also needed advance information electronically with respect to cargo shipments coming into the country uh, and we promulgated at Customs what's called the 24-hour rule, but that rule essentially required that, uh, that Customs be given advance information with respect to, uh, complete information with, electronically with respect to all cargo shipments, ocean-going cargo shipments that were being shipped to the United States 24 hours before those cargo containers were loaded on board vessels outbound from the foreign ports. Not 24 hours before arrival in the U.S., 24 hours before they left the foreign ports for the U.S. And similarly, under some uh, what's called Trade Act le legislation of 2002, we were able to essentially extend these advanced, mani uh, advanced manifest information on cargo shipments to all other modes, commercial trucks, rails, rail shipments, and, and air cargo and the like. Um, we also, as Mr. Ziegler indicated, realized that we had to push our border outward. We had to extend our zone of security, and we did three key things in that direction. One was to create uh, in uh, late 2001, November 2001, the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. This was essentially partnering with the private sector to get a commitment from them to give increased supply chain security literally from the foreign loading docks of their vendors to the U.S. borders. And in exchange, if they met the security standards that we set out in exchange, uh, we would give those companies, we call it CTPAT, expedited processing through the borders of the U.S. That started off with just seven companies, seven major importers of the U.S. in uh, December 2001. There are over 5,000 companies that are now members of the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, and they represent over 40 percent of the volume by value of imports into the United States. So that was, that's, that's the, probably the largest and I believe most successful public-private sector partnership that was formed out of the ashes of 9-11. And then secondly, as an extended border program, we implemented the Container Security Initiative. And the Container Security Initiative was to recognize that, uh, particularly when you're talking about the terrorist, terrorist threat and potential use of a container to conceal a terrorist weapon, even particularly a weapon of mass destruction, uh, or use the container as a weapon, that we needed to do uh, our targeting of uh, cargo containers that were moving for the U.S. and the screening of those containers for at least the high-risk containers, the containers that were identified as posing a potential terrorist threat at foreign seaports. And we proposed in uh, uh, January of 2002 that we start with the top 20 foreign ports, which represented almost 70 percent, over two-thirds of all the containers coming to the United States, and uh, that we implemented at those ports. Uh, and we have been able to implement uh, the Container Security Initiative. The countries representing 19 of the top 20 uh, ports have agreed to implement CSI, the Container Security Initiative, and we have in fact implemented it at 17 foreign ports around the world. And we are continuing, by the way, now to expand that to other ports that ship significant volumes and are strategically <coughs> located of cargo containers to the U.S., to the US places like Malaysia. Um, the, uh, let me also just say, it's in my testimony, we've had some excellent cooperation with Canada and Mexico with respect to smarter borders, that is to say borders that add security 
to both people, the movement of people, and the movement of goods across our borders, and at the same time, do it with respect to some initiatives that actually facilitate the flow of legitimate trade in people. These are programs like the Free and Secure Trade Program with Canada, which we've expanded to Mexico, programs that we worked on with the INS, the Nexus Program, which we've expanded, which is for people who are traveling across our border who are willing to give up basically some of their privacy to submit an application, pay a small fee, and are vetted through the criminal and terrorist indices of both Canada and the United States and are personally interviewed. And if they are determined not to pose a terrorist threat or a threat for smuggling, they are given a proximity card and can get through the border expeditiously. Uh, Mr. Bonner, could you start to sum up, please? I will. Uh, uh, those are a few of the initiatives that we took uh, as part of U.S. Customs. One of the most important uh, initiatives actually was the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. And within this new department, uh, the Customs and Border Protection, which is, for the first time, unifying uh, all of the personnel or agencies that had border responsibilities into one border agency to manage and secure the borders of our country. Uh, we have uh, begun to do that as of March 1, 2003, with the stand-up of the Department. That is to create what Secretary Ridge has called one agency, uh, one, one face at the border, which is one border agency of the federal government to manage, secure, and control our borders. And I can't tell you how important that is to our effectiveness uh, in terms of the terrorist threat. It is extraordinarily important to bring together men and women like Inspector Melendez, who testified earlier here, a uh, former INS inspector, and people like Diana Dean, who was an inspe customs inspector in the state of Washington, who uh, was responsible for catching Ahmad Rassam, uh, the Millennium Bomber. So that, let me conclude my remarks with that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you and the, committee, the Commission for your indulgence. I'll ha answer any questions you have when uh, we get to question time.